Okay, so this is lecture 28 in the lecture series on creating a sustainable international civilization. Um, and the previous one was about the prophet, the tradition of prophets, and what they all had in common with each other. So this one is um, about Confucius, and it more specifically relates some Confucian analects to some of Aristotle's virtues, because this is a foundation uh, from which I'm going to work. The conference at the Vatican was also based on Aristotle's virtues and had representatives from all of those traditions. And if you'd like to read that book, it's a good book. I think if you like this material, you really like the book. But I have to do a very, very condensed version of all of this. I think you'd also like Houston Smith's book. So um, most of my work is just trying to inspire people to do their own work. I know that when I was writing lots of my stuff early on, I was just writing to myself as a graduate student. I just wish someone had written something like what I was writing so that when I was in graduate school, I would know why I was there because I was not there uh, for the same reason that other people were. And if I had thought that that was what philosophy had to offer, that that's what philosophy was, I never would have gone into that, into the discipline. So I had to really find out for myself what I thought philosophy is, and then to do it my way. So, and then I find out there's other people out there too. Um, so that's what I, but I'm also, I will do the best I can to inspire the next generation, even though I know I'm definitely not the only one, but I'll do my part. So um, here's Confucius. Here's just some examples. Again, how many slides do I have? 15 <laughs> out of the whole analytics, really analytics. Um, but it is kind of amazing there's a perennial philosophy. There's a primordial philosophy. All the scholars at the Vatican Academy agreed on this. Many other the people that we read, Capra and Luigi say that, the perennial philosophy. Um, so that's where we're at. Here's Confucius Analects. He gives an example of a universal virtue, one of them is the golden rule. It's, the, I guess, the silver rule. What I do not wish others to do to me, that also I wish not to do to them. Um, Socrates, and then the second point is Socrates says, an unexamined life is worth living, is not worth living. The Athenians should examine themselves and each other every day. Confucius says, I daily examine myself on three points. In planning for others, have I failed in conscientiousness? In intercourse with friends, have I been insincere? And have I failed to practice what I've been taught? Temperate, self-control, and, and generosity or liberality. So these are two fundamental virtues for Aristotle. These are the foundational virtues for developing a free and open society, a stable society. These are the virtues that weave people together and create a strong social fabric. These are the virtues which trigger trust, goodwill, cooperation, collaboration, and everything, you know, the other Higher levels of civilization really depend on these two as their foundation. Confucius says, the scholar who in his food does not seek the gratification of his appetite, nor in his dwelling is solicitous of comfort, who's diligent in his work and guarded in his speech, who associates with the high principle and thereby directs himself aright, such a one may really be said to love learning. So Confucius is very much the scholar. 
So he combines moral virtue and intellectual virtue. So this is a wisdom tradition. Generosity, the philanthropist, is one who, desiring to maintain himself, sustains others, and desiring to develop himself, develops others. To be able from one's own self to draw a parallel for the treatment of others, that may be called the rule of philanthropy. So that is empathy, um, to be able to understand from your own self an analogy with treating others. This is an education by analogy. This is what the neuroscientist long ago was saying is deep reading. So when you read Confucius Analects, it's deep reading. You can find analogies with your own life. Young children can think of their own examples from a pretty young age. And they can also, um, their teachers or their authority figures can model that sort of behavior. They can talk about it. Um, and then Aristotle's whole ethic involves that you become fully human in your interaction with other people. This does not eliminate your individual identity, but it admits that we all depend on each other and we are not rugged individuals. We, we simply do not develop except in relation to other people. So the modern Western view is way, the view of the individual is a lie, really. People are not that self-sufficient. They're not by nature isolated. Sometimes you can construct your life in a way that you've chosen to separate yourself from people, but you still depend on them in many, many ways. You depend on them to create a legal system that will protect you. You depend on them to make safe uh, environments for you to move in. All sorts of ways that people depend on each other, even if they think they're living this very rugged individualist lifestyle. The wisdom traditions also recognize the relationships between the generations and the way that people change throughout their lives. So if you have the ideology of rights, children's rights, universal human rights, the right to life, liberty, the per pursuit of happiness, rights to property, a right to vote. That's you as opposed to anybody else. And it's you, you know, at any, at every time. It doesn't emphasize the, the phases of life and stages of life. At, so Confucius says, at 15, I set my mind on wisdom, and that's a good idea uh, for any person. And it's a part of the way societies are structured. Uh, oh, that oftentimes that's when um, children go to high school. School begins to be taken more seriously. Um, the subject matters taught become subjects that um, adults think about. It's simple enough so you could actually learn the subject in a way that you could become part of your life. Um, but it's not yet specialized. It hasn't become a professional pursuit. At 30, I stood firm. This would be you get married, you have kids, you have a job, you have all these people you're accountable to. Um, you, you just plant your feet on the ground and you have to deal with situations day by day. So that's where practical wisdom, you know, many, many of your decisions are practical. You have to deliberate about lots of different things at age 30. Whereas at 15, you should have some leisure time to think, to think in different time frames to, to separate yourself from what's immediate and just accumulate a body of knowledge, understanding, um, stepping back from day-to-day -day life. At 30, you're completely engaged. At 40, I was free from doubts. And that the image is that you learned to um, 
not to resist you emotionally you actually want to do what's best you've um you've found something that you like to do that's an honorable thing to do you help other people and um now you don't worry about what you worried about when you were younger who am i going to marry if i get married am i going to have kids what sort of job am i going to have so at 40 it comes together now this shows another huge difference between the way confucius describes the life cycle and the way americans or westerners in that rugged individual um, model at 40 people have crises right the midlife crises why because they didn't think about what they wanted earlier on they're just pleasing somebody else somebody else wanted them to make money or power or whatever else and then they resist that or they're self-indulgent uh, for men their testosterone levels start going down they don't want to admit they're getting older they want to have more sex. They want to have more pleasure. And so they divorce their families, marry a woman quite a bit younger. That's a another kind of collapse, blow up in midlife. Um, they have a question, the meaning and purpose of their life. That isn't a wisdom tradition. Everything has meaning and purpose in the wisdom tradition. It's just a matter of you finding what it is that you find most meaningful, that you're good at, that you then dedicate your life to something greater than yourself. But if you're dedicated to yourself in midlife, you're going to have a crisis. <laughs> Life will seem meaningless or you'll seek pleasure. Um, you'll just go off the rails. <laughs> at 50, I understood the laws of heaven. So that would be at 50, you, you can integrate your own spiritual journey with the broader universe. At 60, my ear was docile. At 70, I could follow the desires of my heart without transgressing the right. So the goal is to actually have integrity, not to be internally conflicted, to know your place in the universe. Um, then he says, the meditative treasuring up of knowledge the unwearying pursuit of wisdom, the tireless instruction of others. So this really sounds a lot like Socrates to me, but any sort of wise person would constantly pursue wisdom. They would maintain their knowledge. They would teach others if possible. So yeah, this is um, Socrates again, where he talks about know thyself. So Confucius, it's so amazing how similar they are. Shall I teach you the meaning of knowledge? When you know a thing, to recognize that you know it. And when you do not, to know that you do not know, that is knowledge. I think that's so amazing. <laughs> what is there about the human condition that with those two icons from totally different parts of the world, they didn't read each other's books, they didn't read each other's minds. They were just thoughtful people and they came up to this same sort of life lesson that they learned and that they want to teach to posterity. Talented yet seeking knowledge from the untalented. Of many attainments yet seeking knowledge from those with few. Offended against yet not retaliating. I had a friend who lived in this manner. So Confucius also, you know, says, gee, there's people who are better than me. He's not jealous of them. He, he is inspired by them. He keeps them in his mind uh, as people that he should aspire to be more like. Um, this is also not elitist in the sense that if you belong to a certain class, or you have privilege, you're somehow better or wiser than others. So the kind of knowledge that anybody can be this way, no matter how, you know, PhD or none, you know, college or not, you can be thoughtful and you can seek knowledge from people that don't have all the kudos that you have. That has nothing to do with the quality of your life. The only 
caveat to that is not being educated might increase the chances that you would be manipulated by a rhetorician, but not necessarily so. There are a lot of college educated people who are voting for Trump and uh, you know, maybe they don't believe any of his rhetoric. I don't know, but they don't think it's a problem. So whatever reason they have that they don't think that's a problem, um, I would say they'd have a lot to learn from some less formally educated people who really do know they're some that he's out to get them. He has no interest in them. So that's something to keep in mind, that that kind of, it's not elitist. These traditions get labeled. Aristotle gets labeled elitist, but I think he would favor this kind of wisdom where you're always trying to learn from everyone else. If you're, if you're good at the art of statecraft and you weave the rich and poor together, you definitely have to learn from everyone. Okay, what about avoiding arrogance? That's a big issue in all the traditions because we're born ignorant and we have to know so much in order to know how to live. And there's no way we know all of that. So we have to admit when we don't know. As to being a sage or a man of virtue, how dare I presume to such a claim? But as to striving thereafter, unwearyingly, and teaching others therein without flagging. That can be said of me, and that is all. I, you know, I seek virtue. And, um, you know, I keep asking, what is virtue? Socrates did that too. How should I live? This is the question. Socrates taught through dialogue. Um, and so does Confucius. Am I indeed a man with innate knowledge? I have no such knowledge. But when an uncultivated person in all simplicity comes to me with a question, I thrash out its pros and cons until I fathom it. So that's what Socrates did also. He engaged in dialogue with people. Some, most of them were privileged just because they were the ones destroying the city not because um, he was a snob about less educated people. In the Republic, it said most common people, they just don't want to get used. And that's where the privileged use middle, lower class people as pawns in their schemes to get rich and powerful, and they drive everyone into the ground. And so when Socrates focuses his attention on the elite, it's not because he is one or he aspires to be one. It's because he cares about the city. He cares about cultivating our humanity and he cares about people in the lower and middle class. Okay, what about the doctrine of the mean between extremes? Well, Confucius has that same doctrine. How perfect is the virtue that accords with the golden mean and how long it has been rare among the people. So I think that was amazing when I read that. Of course, it's a translation. But if you look at, you know, specific examples, it really does mean a middle ground between extremes. So the next quote is a specific example. Courtesy uncontrolled by the laws of good taste becomes labored effort. Caution uncontrolled becomes timidity, right? So there's a virtue, but then when it goes to an extreme, it's not a virtue anymore. Boldness uncontrolled becomes recklessness. Frankness uncontrolled becomes effrontery. Okay, so um, caution uncontrolled, that would be courage right? That would be not enough. You're not aggressive enough. Boldness uncontrolled is you're too aggressive. Um, truthfulness is good, but it can become inappropriate. Um, 
And courtesy is good, but not if it, just like um, self knowledge is good and the and being humble is good, but you can be self deprecating. And so um, courtesy taken to an extreme is just sort of servility and nobody, it's not natural to treat yourself that way. Um, the basic teachings, love God and love your neighbor, um, is also in Muhammad. Fix your mind on the right way. Hold fast to it in your moral character. Follow it up in kindness to others. Take your recreation in the polite arts. Though the odes number 300. So this is where all of them, all these leaders talk about the, the holy books and how for Jesus, it was the Old Testament. They have all these laws and rules. Uh, Muhammad talks about the external Quran. Um, but they say, okay, don't take it literally and don't get lost in it. Even though the odes number 300, one phrase covers them all with purpose undiverted. So you just stay focused, what is virtue? What's the good way to live? Love God, love your neighbors, yourself. Uh, live in harmony with the universe. So Confucius tends to emphasize harmony, the big harmony, the great harmony, the harmony within you, and the harmony in relationships. A man may be able to recite the 300 odes, but if, when given a post in the administration, he proves to be without practical ability or when sent anywhere, he's unable to answer a question of what use is his knowledge. And, and I've had that experience as a PhD in a PhD program, is that I can I was asked to memorize or to know a whole lot of stuff, but it did not improve. I, I you know, I could know about Aristotle's of virtue, theory of virtues, but I wasn't very virtuous. <laughs> And the reward system for, you know, learning the Greek and studying the text for days, hours, years, um, really was a corruption of character because I became isolated. I did, I lost social emotional skills. Um, I lost my mind, basically became fixated on words in a book. And they're all telling you not to do that. The importance of the art. When the master was in Xi, he heard the Shao music, and for three months he was unconscious of the taste of meat. I did not imagine, said he, that music had reached such perfection. Then Confucius said, my disciples, why do you not study the poets? Poetry is able to stimulate the mind. It can train to observation. It can encourage social intercourse. It can modify the vexations of life. From it, the student learns to fulfill his most immediate duty to his parents um, and his remoter duty to his prince. So, and then let the character be formed by the poets, established by the laws of right behavior and perfected by music. So these ancient traditions, in all of them, the arts are really important. Music, dance, uh, poetry, literature, the whole um, worship experience has all of these elements in it. Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. It's usually some ritual food. Um, it's really nice. And it, its goal is integrity emotional education, the integration of your emotions with your thoughts and your way of life and your deliberations about what to do. A good ruler, so this, uh, the second part, so, so Confucius has a lot of advice about your personal life, about your friendships, but then he has advice about being a good ruler. Aristotle's definition of justice is to rule for the well-being of the ruled. This can apply to parents, teachers, coaches, siblings, employers, friends, administrators, and political rulers. It must 
the person has to be a good person, a good role model, and inspire the rules. Be a leader. Quote, if you govern the people with laws and keep them in order by penalties, they will avoid the penalties, yet lose their sense of shame. But if you govern them by your moral excellence and keep them in order by your dutiful conduct, they will retain their sense of shame and also live up to the standard. So um, again, it's all about internalizing those virtues and you can't force it. You can't try to externally control behavior. You will never get people to be virtuous and the legal system will break down eventually because you can't have laws for everything. You'll break, you will lose trust and goodwill for the people for each other, the people for the ruler. Everything will be out of sync, out of harmony. The karma will, you know, will be bad karma and it will, you will have lost your mind. So however you think of it, you will lost your relationship to God. They're all very similar in what you need to do and what you shouldn't do. In a healthy society, according to Aristotle, people have trust and goodwill for each other and for the ruler. When the people and leaders are corrupt, the laws function only as tools to prevent bad people from harming each other. Aristotle says this is not a polis at all. A polis is a community of citizens living together under a common body of laws that provides a middle-class life and leisure time so people can engage in the uniquely human ways of flourishing. Free scientific inquiry, not forced. The government doesn't force you. The corporations don't force you by having it the only way you can make a living and survive is to, is to do their bidding. So there's free scientific inquiry, free artistic expression, free speech, freedom of association, engagement in public life, transparency of the powerful to show how they're using their power and why. The leaders know how to make and apply laws that develop a truly free society and can convince the people to agree. In an unhealthy society, the laws function as tools to prevent bad people from harming each other. And Aristotle says this is not a political community at all. Confucius says, is a prince able to rule his country with courtesy and deference? Then what difficulty will he have? So this would be the good ruler, right? The inspiring ruler, the, the statecraft. And if he cannot rule his country with courtesy and deference, what use are the forms of courtesy to him? You can't force people to be virtuous, um, but you can lead and inspire. It's emotions. You have to educate emotions. And you do that through setting an example for showing that you take pleasure in being just and in helping people out. What need is there of capital punishment in your administration? If your aspirations are good, the people will be good. The oral character of those in high positions is the breeze. The character of those below is the grass. When the grass has the breeze upon it, it assuredly bends. So the oral character would be and, and Plato says this also, that the written word is not worth very much. The real mind comes out when people converse with each other and when they, right, when they talk, that's when your character is really revealed, not when you write something that somebody else reads that's detached from who you are. The ruler has to have trust and goodwill. So Aristotle said that's a major virtue for a stable society. So when, um, okay, when Su Kung asked, um, what are the essentials? What were the essentials 
of government, Confucius replied, sufficient food, sufficient forces, and the confidence of the people. Suppose I were compelled to dispense with one. Which of the three should I forego first? The forces. Because if people are really committed to their nation, they will protect themselves collectively with together as a whole against outside interference. Suppose I were compelled to eliminate another. Which one? The food. For from old death has been um, has been the, the loss of all men. And so um, uh, the lot, sorry, boy, I didn't get this type very well, has been the lot of all men, but a people without faith cannot stand. So again, if you're in such a desperate situation, and the people know that the ruler is ruling for the benefit of the ruled. That's the most important thing. Otherwise, you'll have chaos and um, destruction everywhere. So that was Confucius' main point, is the bond that a good ruler creates. Well, that's been a horrible problem in the United States. People don't trust their leaders. And... That was part of a rhetorical strategy by a certain political party because the people, my students say they're all corrupt. They're all equally corrupt. This is not true at all. But if you just, in your, in your rhetorical political campaigns, all you do is accuse your opponent of being corrupt instead of having arguments about what is your platform what would you like to do and why is that good? If you just accuse them of being corrupt, then people will think everybody's corrupt and they will tend to vote for the worst people because the worst people are going to have the, the most fear-driven, pleasure-driven, fantasy-driven, manipulative rhetoric. And if you think they're all equally bad, you could easily be manipulated by the rhetoric. You have to learn to step back from all the rhetoric, find out what these politicians' policies have been, what has the political party done in the last 50 years, where is it headed, what's the background of this person, what have they done as a politician, what sort of personal life have they had, what is their motive as far as you can tell. Do they really want to create a better society, as far as you can tell? Are they well-intentioned, but not very good at it? Or are they, are they really in it just for the power? Okay, the principles of government. Let the prince be prince. Let the minister um, be a minister. Um, I don't know. Let the father be a father and let the son be a son. So if everyone's playing their roles, if everybody's ruling for the benefit of the ruled, then it will all be good. There will be the great harmony. Now, the, the problem is the power of rhetoric, which today is very true. Fake news, misinformation to destroy a political community. This is interesting because Socrates was most angry with the sophists because they taught the future leaders the power of persuasion. Once they had that skill and they taught it in private lessons so that when these educated, when these young people or leaders who had this skill that the public did, was not aware of, they hadn't been taught to identify logical fallacies. They, and so they, they could easily be manipulated. So the goal of this, the fathers, the parents of children that, that the fathers wanted to gain power and money would pay these sophists. And um, once they paid them, they had this power to do whatever they want. 
All they had to do was persuade the people in the assembly and the jurors in the court to vote with them. So this power of persuasion was a major factor in the destruction of Athenian democracy or any democracy. So what does Confucius say? The prince is awaiting you to take control of his administration. What will you undertake first? The correction of terms. A wise man in regard to what he does not understand maintains an attitude of reserve. If terms be incorrect, statements do not accord with facts. And when statements and facts do not accord, business is not properly executed. When business is not properly executed, order and harmony do not flourish. When order and harmony do not flourish, justice becomes arbitrary. When justice becomes arbitrary, the people do not know how to move hand or foot. Hence, whatever a wise man states, he can always define, and what he so defines, he can always carry into practice. For the wise man will on no account have anything remiss in his definitions. So I think this is pretty amazing also because it's such a huge issue. Um, this year, 2024, half of the world's people have had or will have elections. And the big factor in these elections has been rhetoric, has been um, the abuse of terms the misuse, deliberate misuse of terms to manipulate people, that it only it not only destroys democracy, but even Confucius, who basically wanted, was talking to a prince. He didn't want a change in the constitution. He didn't fight for elections. But what he wanted was how does the leader use his authority? So when you have this rhetoric, how do the political operatives, how do the campaign directors, how do the professional advertisers, how do they all use their skill or develop this very corrupt skill? And so it's an abuse of the power that they have. The power to persuade is being totally abused and that's a misuse of power. They do have an advantage, right? They have the skill that other people don't have and they abuse it. And so that's what I would call elitism. And so again, that Aristotle would not do that, right? Aristotle's state person with statecraft would be honest and would keep his language simple or her and would speak about rule for the benefit of the rules or rule for the benefit of the rulers and would always argue for why am I doing this? Because it promotes a middle class. It promotes human flourishing. It promotes the flourishing of the society into the next generation. If you want to have a world for your children, we have to have this sustainable future. And we have to level with ourselves about what we're doing now and how much we have to change. So... So politicians should be honest, but does the public want an honest politician, right? Sometimes a person would like to tell the public the truth, but they really do want to get reelected because their opponent is wicked and will abuse their power and stick with fossil fuels and create animosity and destroy democracy in a democracy or destroy harmony in any sort of society. So this, these are real big issues. And I do think it's amazing that Confucius um, says all these things. And so in the next lecture, I show how America's founders likes Confucius Analects and they understood that Americans should read these and internalize these in order to maintain American democracy. So I think that's pretty interesting.